Yeah, of course. So um, firstly, thanks for the time and thanks for taking the time to, uh, to make the interview. Um, so I'm the general manager of our health industry business worldwide at Microsoft. Um, and that covers everything from um, what we're doing in um, you know, massively well supplied countries to ones that are, um, have a much um, higher scarcity of resource. Um, and I'm really excited about the opportunity to be here and to talk and meet with all the folks who are working in global health in general and A, learn a bit more and also educate a bit more about what digital health can do um, and how it can um, improve the lives of um, both those who are providing care and those who are receiving care. Um, but also perhaps plant a few ideas in people's heads about some things that could be done on a broader scale um, to improve uh, the uptake of digital health, which is still in pretty early days, particularly in some of the developing nations. Great. Um, on that note, could you speak a little bit about how your work intersects with the Millennium Development Goals uh, and how digital health might help drive progress in that regard? Yeah, I mean, there's the obvious point of if you can't measure things, they're a hobby, right? And so making things more... Uh, clearly measured, clearly analyzed, data and information are at the center of a lot of the goals, not just in terms of how you measure them, but how they get, um, how they get distributed and used. So everything from analytics to basic you know, collaboration are, are, central to, are central to that. And then you can look at specific goals and look at how technology, um, uh, whether it's from Microsoft or from other people, can really help accelerate um, uh, knowledge and information around that. I'll, I'll give you an example. The, actually, the winner um, of the technology award at the, at the GBC Health was a fantastic project, um, which I didn't know was using Microsoft technology until I, until I met them to, um, two days ago, um, where they're um, looking at initially managing cases for itinerant workers and mining workers in South Africa. Lots of problems with both communicable and non-communicable diseases down there. And they reiterated, they, they created technology and, and reinvented and reiterated it time after time rather than spending hours and hours thinking about what they should do. And they just got in there. Um, and now they're managing to use the data that they're collecting from over like 260,000 interactions, I think, last year to do much more um, analysis and trend mapping and looking at the epidemiology and seeing what's going on, which is really in line with a lot of the information that we're trying to gather and, and use to shape not just how we get to the Millennium Goals, but what we do after those as well. Yeah, of course. Two main things that we're really working on hard and, and excited about the, the impact they're going to have in health. First thing is devices. Um, it's been really interesting, the uptake of tablets in healthcare. Um, but today they've been, A, frankly, a bit of a luxury device, uh, and B, have not been deeply integrated into the clinical environment because often the tablets that are around today were not built as kind of enterprise class devices with, with all the security that you need. Um, so two things we're doing in that space. One, there's a, a great plethora of devices coming out with the launch of Windows 8. Um, uh, that are really well, well suited to the medical environments. Um, some of them are ruggedized, some of them are incredibly thin, long battery life, but they're all enterprise class devices. So all the, all the questions that people have around the data security, all those can be answered. And then secondly, as part of that, devices space is a lot more real um, entry price devices, um, and both in the phone space and small screen tablets, um, which I think are going to be really, really important as we think about how we can make a really affordable impact on how digital health gets deployed. So, so that's number one. Number two is, is, is the cloud and cloud services. Um, health is a pretty fragmented supply chain wherever you look. Even when you look at the big you know, nationalized systems like the National Health Service in the UK, it's actually pretty local and pretty fragmented in how it gets delivered. And so providing um, enterprise class, again, um, and easy to stand up solutions um, using cloud technology is incredibly important. And we've worked hard both in terms of the collaboration systems we've got. So we've got a version of Office called Office 365, which runs entirely in the cloud. You don't need to put anything on your machines, you don't need big server farms, anything like that. Um, and Azure, which is our Windows-based um, uh, database and application platform in the cloud, we can do these things at a much faster rate, um, particularly in places where there's not so much infrastructure. Um, I came back from Brazil recently, and there was a, a system there uh, built by a Portuguese partner called Ongoing. And they had, uh, in three months, rolled this system out to 265 hospitals and clinics in Rio State, over a million records on that. And when you compare that to what's going on um, 
uh, I mean, the US is accelerating fast, but a lot of the systems out here take way too long to deploy, and they're way, way too expensive. And cloud technology answers a lot of that. So devices and cloud is, is kind of where we're pushing, and, and both are, are really well suited to the problems we're seeing in digital health today. Yeah, well, and you know, the interesting thing about the health sector is there's probably more change going on it now, going on in, in the health sector everywhere than there has ever been before. And in some senses, the cloud protects them from that because the fact that we're putting solutions up there which they don't have to worry about maintaining, upgrading, that takes a lot of those, those problems away. But there's still a lot of work we've got to do um, to help people feel confident about putting things in the cloud. There are still a lot of... Um, concerns and frankly some out, really outdated legis legislation around patient data privacy. Now patient data has to be secure, it has to be private, but we can actually do a lot more than I think most governments realize um, with cloud technology today. And so a lot of the work that I do and a lot of the work that my colleagues do is try and explain both um, gently through kind of anecdotes of what other countries are doing and sometimes a little bit more forcibly um, about um, how you know, lack of uptake of cloud technology can, can, can make change harder for the health system and harder for them, for them to keep up. Yeah, um, two pieces of advice. First thing is always focus on the benefit for the end user, the person who's going to be using the system. You see too many people putting large amounts of money into um, you know, ideas or projects based on what the systemic benefits are going to be. You know, we're going to decrease um, a particular non-communicable disease by X percent by doing this. Those are great outcomes, but the real outcome that gets people using the systems are the ones that um, make either the, you know, the, the consumer, the patient, or the doc um, get value out of it in the moment that they're using it. So firstly, always think about that. Think about the benefit of the person who's going to be using the system. Make it attractive, exciting, um, you know, beautiful even to use, and you'll get much more uptake. And then number two, back to the cloud thing. Nobody's buying servers these days. <laughs> Build it on the cloud, do it in a cloud that's compliant with patient data security laws, wherever you're, wherever you're deploying that, um, and, and reiterate fast. Don't spend, all, don't spend hours and hours, weeks and weeks, months and months planning. Have an idea, try it, see how it works, and then use iterative uh, development processes to make it better and better.